Hello, everyone. I am Rachel Paul with IAAP. Thank you for joining us today for our third webinar in our Accessible Digital Content mini-series. Today's webinar title is Audio Description as an Aesthetic Innovation. Before we begin, we just have a few housekeeping items to go over. We do have closed captioning available. You can select the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We also will be providing a stream text link in the chat if you prefer to follow uh, captions in another browser. We have a sign language interpreter joining us today. We do have um, microphones muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. And we will be recording today's webinar and it will be available in our archives uh, later. We'll be monitoring the chat for any general dialogue or technical issues. And we encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A and we will have some time to answer those at the end of today's webinar. So I'm happy to welcome Joel Snyder, our presenter today. And uh, go ahead and take it over, Joe. Joel, thank you. Well, I will. I'm just responding to a kind note in the chat already. How about that? I'm monitoring the chat. Let me share my screen and get going with this here. Uh, this should be fun. Let me just uh, pull this together, make sure I have everything uh, online here. All right, I'm getting there. Make sure I have sound on. Oops, let me try this again. Let me... <laughs> Beth is keeping up with my rambling there. I see that. That's good. <laughs> All right. Share sound is on. There you go. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, A. Double AP. I've been a member for golly since its beginning, I guess. This um, session is all about um, audio description, which is a translation of visual images to words for the benefit primarily of people who are blind or have low vision. So uh, I'm going to practice what I preach. I've got a screen up in front of you here. Mostly it's text. Uh, how do you make text accessible to somebody that can't see it? Well, you, you voice it. So that's what I'm going to do. IAAP, International Association of Accessibility Professionals, Audio Description Associates, LLC, the visual made verbal, and the American Council of the Blind's Audio Description Project present audio description as an aesthetic innovation with Joel Snyder, PhD, President, Audio Description Associates, LLC, and the founder of Senior Consultant to the Audio Description Project of ACB, the American Council of the Blind, June 16th, 2022, 11 a.m. to noon, Eastern Daylight Time. And at the bottom, four words, American Audio Description Symbol. And there is an image there, a logo, a white square, within which are two letters in bold black type, an A and a D. The left side of that A is tilted just a bit to the right, and to the right of the curve in the D, three curved lines, period. Why do I say that? Well, because I have found that sometimes describers will go on and add something like, oh, they represent sound waves. Well, that's true, but there's nothing on the screen that says that for sighted people, why would you add that information for folks who are blind? No, no, um, it, it, at best it's unnecessary. At worst, it could seem even condescending or patronizing. There's no, no reason why even a congenitally blind person wouldn't have exposure to what three curved lines might represent. Yeah, here's the thing, we describe, we don't explain, we show, we don't tell. So there's a little bit about our audience and a little bit about the fundamentals of audio description. With respect to uh, this session, audio description as an aesthetic innovation, I wanna share a quote from Rudolf von Laban's The Mastery of Movement in 1950. You may have heard of Laban notation or his effort shape series of indicating movement with symbols. In his introduction to the mastery of movement, he wrote, what really happens in a theater does not occur 
only on the stage or in the audience, but within the magnetic current between both these poles. He goes on to suggest that the performers on stage, they form the active uh, pole of this magnetic circuit and are responsible for the integrity of purpose in the performance that determines the quality of the exciting current between stage and audience. I like that phrase. But what if the exchange is interrupted or incomplete, not by a lack of clarity on stage, but by rather by an audience member's lack of access to full perception? How can a blind person see a, a film or a dance performance? Well, that's where we get to audio description. Audio description is, as I said, a translation of images to words. The, the visual is made verbal and uh, aural, A-U-R-A-L, he points to his ear, and oral, O-R-A-L, he points to his mouth. Now, audio description makes visual images accessible for people who are blind or in low vision. Um, and, and I think of it as a literary for art form. It's about words. It's a kind of poetry. It, I, I call it a haiku because we use as few words as possible to relay a succinct, vivid and imaginative description. Media describers convey that visual image from television and film content that by the way, is not fully accessible to a significant segment of the population. Uh, the, the American Foundation for the Blind not too long ago uh, noted that there are over 31 million Americans who are either blind or have trouble seeing even with correction. That's a lot of folks, that's 8% of the population. Add in their friends, their families, et cetera. Add in people uh, with learning disabilities and, and other situations. Um, yeah, we provide benefits for the sighted audience uh, who may never, in addition, I should say, the audio description is valuable for a sighted audience who may never fully realize all that can be perceived with the eyes. You know that, right? We see, but we don't observe. Sure. And, and by the way, on television, I oftentimes call description being big for people who are blind or, or low vision, but also sighted people who want to be in the kitchen making a sandwich while the television is on in the living room. You don't miss a beat because you can hear what you can't see. Not because you're blind, but you're in the wrong room. So with that little introduction, let me demonstrate for you uh, and consider the power of audio description as an access technique with an example of traditional audio description. Then we'll move into how it can be an aesthetic innovation as well. I wanna share with you now a, a, an excerpt from a feature film, The Color of Paradise, marvelous film. You may have heard of it, uh, one of my favorites. Um, and, and, uh, but I want you to experience it as a blind person would have in a movie theater about 25 years ago when it came out, there was no audio description. You know, you're a blind person, you're in the movie theater. Uh, well, okay, it's a major film though. It has a professional soundtrack. You know, it should be not a problem, right? It just let, let's get a sense of it. You're, you're blind, you, you don't have access to the image. I'm not gonna show the video, but I'm just gonna show the original play the original soundtrack for you shouldn't be a problem let let's um should it uh, be a problem at all i don't know let's let's give it a try
I loved watching Beth sign that. How many different ways can you sign tweet? You know, uh, whoa, what was going on? I, oh, I was getting, I was getting bored. I bet a couple of you fell asleep. You nodded off, didn't you? Yeah. What now, imagine you're a blind person in the movie theater. Uh, after about 30 seconds, yeah, I'm out of there, right? What, I don't get it. What, this is supposed to be an enjoyable, what, or, or you're with your elbow to your friend, you know, what's going on? What's going on? Hey, what's going on? Right, right. And then they, they, you talk and then that disturbs everybody else. And oh, uh, this is a problem. Uh, I'm not sure what to do about it. Uh, well, no, I am sure what to do. We'll try anyway. Let's, let's, I'm going to make you sit through this again. This is going to take till next Tuesday or something, I think. I don't know. That was so long. Um, but let's do it again. This time we're going to add, though, you're still blind. We're going to add to the original soundtrack the audio description that I wrote and voiced when this was broadcast on ABC uh, 20 years ago, something like that on television. Ah, I don't know. That was kind of a mess. Uh, will, will it make any difference? I'm not really sure. Um, well, let's see by listening. Muhammad kneels and taps his hands through the thick round cover of brown curled leaves. A scrawny nestling struggles on the ground near Muhammad's hand. His palm hovers above the baby bird. He lays his hand lightly over the tiny creature. Smiling, Muhammad curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. He stands and strokes its nearly featherless head with a fingertip. Muhammad starts as the bird nips his finger. He taps his finger on the chick's gaping beak. He tilts his head back, then drops it forward. Muhammad tips the chick into his front shirt pocket. Wrapping his legs and arms around a tree trunk, Muhammad climbs. He latches onto a tangle of thin upper branches. His legs flail for a foothold. Muhammad stretches an arm between a fork in the trunk of the tree and wedges in his head and shoulder. His shoes slip on the rough bark. He wraps his legs around the lower trunk, then uses his arms to pull himself higher. He rises into thicker foliage and holds onto tangles of smaller branches. Gaining his footing, Muhammad stands upright and cocks his head to one side. An adult bird flies from a nearby branch. Muhammad extends his open hand. He touches a branch and runs his fingers over wide green leaves. He pats his hand down the length of the branch. His fingers trace the smooth bark of the upper branches, search the network of connecting tree limbs, and discover their joints. Above his head, Muhammad's fingers find a dense mass of woven twigs, a bird's nest. Smiling, he removes the chick from his shirt pocket and drops it gently into the nest beside another fledgling. He rubs the top of the chick's head with his index finger. Muhammad wiggles his finger like a worm and taps a chick's open beak. Smiling, he slowly lowers his hand. Okay, all right. That was a little bit more clear, yes? Uh, and it seems shorter. What's that about? Uh, you know, it, it held our attention, uh, obviously. Yeah, well, I, we're coming to the part that I really like because I'm now going to grant sight to all of you. <laughs> who had sight when we began this session. I'm gonna play this darn thing again, but this time with the image. And I want you to, to think about the, the images that were chosen for description. Why weren't other images chosen? I want you to think about the words used to describe the visual images. What's that about? And then we'll quickly go through a, an annotated uh, script 
for the description to point out some fundamentals of description before kind of moving on to how this can be uh, an aesthetic innovation. I think even traditional audio description is an art form, is a kind of aesthetic. Uh, and by the way, I think that perhaps uh, some of you will be a little surprised about 15 seconds into this video. Um, and um, um, I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but uh, uh, let's, let's give it a look. Here you go, Color of Paradise video with audio description. Muhammad kneels and taps his hands through the thick round cover of brown curled leaves. A scrawny nestling struggles on the ground near Muhammad's hand. His palm hovers above the baby bird. He lays his hand lightly over the tiny creature. Smiling, Muhammad curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. He stands and strokes its nearly featherless head with a fingertip. Muhammad is blind. Muhammad starts as the bird nips his finger. He taps his finger on the chick's gaping beak. He tilts his head back, then drops it forward. Muhammad tips the chick into his front shirt pocket. Wrapping his legs and arms around a tree trunk, Muhammad climbs. He latches onto a tangle of thin upper branches. His legs flail for a foothold. Muhammad stretches an arm between a fork in the trunk of the tree and wedges in his head and shoulder. His shoes slip on the rough bark. He wraps his legs around the lower trunk, then uses his arms to pull himself higher. He rises into thicker foliage and holds onto tangles of smaller branches. Gaining his footing, Muhammad stands upright and cocks his head to one side. An adult bird flies from a nearby branch. Muhammad extends his open hand. He touches a branch and runs his fingers over wide green leaves. He pats his hand down the length of the branch. His fingers trace the smooth bark of the upper branches, search the network of connecting tree limbs, and discover their joints. Above his head, Muhammad's fingers find a dense mass of woven twigs, a bird's nest. Smiling, he removes the chick from his shirt pocket and drops it gently into the nest beside another fledgling. He rubs the top of the chick's head with his index finger. Muhammad wiggles his finger like a worm and taps the chick's open beak. Smiling, he slowly lowers his hand. There you go. And here's the, the script with a few annotations that I think will help you think a bit about the fundamentals of description. Right at the very beginning, you know, he taps his hands through the thick ground cover of brown curled leaves. Brown curled leaves. What does that show you? It doesn't tell you it's autumn. It shows you it's autumn. And color. Color has been shown to be important to people with low vision. Uh, even people who are congenitally blind, again, they grow up in the world. They know that green means money, right? In this country anyway, uh, it's more than just a hue or a, a spectrum of light. Yeah, uh, a little bit later on, gasping, chirping. That's a cue really, just a couple of uh, uh, bits of sound that we want people to hear. And then we come in with the description. Timing is critical in the crafting of description. We weave descriptive language around a film's sound elements. And then um, <clears throat> later in that paragraph, he curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. Yeah, vivid verbs help conjure items, images rather in the, in the mind's eye. He doesn't just grab it, he doesn't pick it up, he scoops it. Yeah, uh, uh, then um, ah, a little later, he taps his finger on the chick's gaping beak he tilts his head back, then drops it forward. Muhammad tips the chick into his front shirt pocket, taps, tilts, tips. Description, again, like much poetry, yes, is written to be heard. Alliteration adds variety and helps to maintain interest. 
a little bit later, an adult bird flies from a nearby branch. Well, what should we include? Most description is about really what not to describe. We need to see everything and then we get rid of most of it. That image is important because the adult bird returns in the next scene. And we take our cues from the, the director or the cinematographer. He's touching the branch, his fingers find the nest. That's what's being focused on. And we that tells us because we, we, we are clued into that kind of filmic literacy that tells us what to describe. And then at the end, uh, he rubs the top of the chick's head with his index finger, not his pinky, not his thumb. No, be specific. Precision creates images. And he wiggles his finger like a worm, like a worm. Yeah, similes paint pictures. And there's no worm there. But by invoking something that you can't see, we help people see what is there if they're blind or they have low vision or whatever uh, else may be the situation. Now, how does one include, incorporate accessibility even more uh, intimately? Um, audio description in particular, how does one do this as an aesthetic innovation? Uh, the theory of inclusive design describes one common approach to accessibility. The main tenets are, one, the designers consider as many different human abilities, limitations, and needs as possible. And number two, these factors should be included from the beginning of the design process. You know, while audio description benefits a wide audience, it's, it is rarely considered from the beginning of the process as a, it's a post-production activity, uh, similar to other localization accommodations like subtitling or dubbing or sign interpretation, it's added on most times. Uh, many fi filmmakers actually have a very limited awareness of the existence of audio description and even less understanding of the latest research which suggests how the access technique can be incorporated within the development of a film. It's then not that add-on, right? It's an aesthetic innovation and an organic part of the work that uh, really benefits all people. In fact, when I uh, coordinated funding uh, for the uh, from the Interdisciplinary Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts, I wrote guidelines that read in part, this category encourages experimentation in the area of accessibility as an aesthetic innovation. In other words, interdisciplinary work with sound elements that are visually accessible through the use of maybe computer graphic technology. Visual elements that are tactile or oral, innovative use of signing or audio description or captions, movement involving older people, disabled people. So let me share with you a couple of recent video projects that have that really demonstrate including access as a part of the whole, following these tenets of inclusive design. Members of these creative teams took responsibility for accessibility as part of the production process, eliminating the need to add a separate layer after the fact. So the production becomes accessible to a wider audience, but also adds an aesthetic dimension. You know, it, it allows filmmakers to meet an obligation for inclusion while incorporating innovative techniques and that increases the production's aesthetic viability. I think these examples demonstrate how video uh, in particular can incorporate uh, alternative audio description from the perspective of inclusive design as well as its use as a novel production technique. I've got three examples for you. The first is Odd Job Jack, the episode Donut Jack. It comes from us from the great Deborah Fells at Ryerson University, who's experimented with this for a while. It's a, an episode called Donut Jack, a little risque. So heads up, you can turn your thing off there for a minute and 12 seconds if you're uh, easily offended or what have you. Uh, an example from a speech uh, at Hamlet, an audio clip where they included description in the script as in iambic pentameter. Is that cool? And then finally, the great Stevie Wonder. And uh, he did the first music video with description. This is it. So what the fuss? 
you can get that as a as a standalone music video with no description but he wanted it to be described and i i can't imagine watching it enjoying it without the description so let's uh let's take a look here here you go donut jack they basically create a, a narrator that describes as it goes along up to the drive through window of a donut shop. Our giant wiener pulled into the giant donut. What can I get you? Three coffees and a 12 of crullers. Make that 10 coffees. I'm really thirsty. Uh, a dozen coffees and uh, your phone number, please? Sure. Just make sure you call when Pa's out in the field. You're uh, farmer's daughter? That's right, sugar glaze. Hang on a sec. Jack, can we... There's a cornfield round the back. Let's go. I awoke to see Bobby running like a madman. Jack! Start the car! Jack! Behind him was a farmer pursuing him on a tractor. What's up? Uh, we're stuck. Give me a push! But I love him, Daddy. Push! Push! Mm. Push! Mm. Harder! Bobby pushed our wiener in and out of the giant donut, getting a rhythm going Push! to the last release. Let's haul wiener! Bobby jumped aboard the wiener. I'm gonna get me that son of a bitch. Ah, now that was some serious action. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, moving, to the moving right along, uh, something a little more formal. Hamlet, uh, a soliloquy from Hamlet written as description in iambic pentameter. Is that cool or what? Listen to this. I pray. And so we go to find and teach our prince to speak of what was learned upon the tower. A great ball is set within the castle in the grandest room as wide and high and clear. All paths, stairs, landings in the castle large lead to the hall of the celebration. The ball, inflamed in fire, from torches lit, is full of courtiers and ambassadors. The lords and ladies dance. They dance, and they drink with courtly manners, ply their country games. The lords spin their ladies, lift and toss them high, and all in dance and drink give joy this night. At once, the king and queen enter the ball, with Polonius following in suit. The queen in velvet with jewels and trim of gold, the king with strength in new crown atop his head. Now... And finally, Stevie Wonder, the first music video with audio description. Again, I can't separate it, but uh, uh, the, the description from the music video. He took great care with this. <coughs> Excuse me. It was written um, by our colleagues at WGBH in Boston, where audio, audio description on broadcast television began, really. <coughs> Excuse me. I wrote and voiced uh, three of the first programs broadcast on, on PBS back in the 80s with WGBH. Well, uh, Stevie had WGBH craft some description. He consulted with it, them on it and, and so that it would match the tone of the piece and a stroke of genius. He had it voiced by his friend, uh, the, the rapper Busta Rhymes. So it really makes it of a piece. Um, see if you agree. All right, here's, uh, here's how it's going down. Now, in an urban neighborhood, teens hang out on the front stoop of a three-story brownstone. Inside, Stevie Wonder sits at a keyboard in the center of a spacious studio. A man grabs a bass guitar off the stand and four women cross the dark room. As a shadowy guitarist joins them, adults of all races and ages mingle in the hall and at the party. Stevie leans close to a gold tip microphone as he plays. A teen on the front steps turns his head sharply. At the party, women struck by a smile and a boy in the hall listens by an air vent. Stevie's backup singers dance at their mic stands. It's in vogue. Our view floats up to a vent behind them and away from a vent at the party. A lounging guest leans towards it. 
Nearby, a man checks out a woman's swaying hips as she passes. The guests clear the room with furniture and a man sprinkles fine powder on a hardwood floor. And if we live in a time where everything Stevie's fingers glide over the keys. At the party, a dancer drags his toe through the powder. The lounging guest bobs his head. As two gang kids fight near storefront TV sets, the screens show explosions. Now, in Stevie's studio, the bass guitar strings turn into vibrating wall pipes that lead to the party. On the dance floor, a twirling man's hat flies off. A woman in gold heels presses against her partner. As she leans back, he feels a bit stunning. So what the fuck? Now, Stevie plays a pearly white drum set. If I gotta get up early, get At the party, adults and children gather in the kitchen. Stevie's bass drum becomes the tire of a car outside. The teens out front help push the stalled car. If my children are playing, Inside, a little girl touches her mother's face. Out front, a bearded man in a wheelchair wears African beads, and a white girl's head gets braided into cornrows by her black friend. Now a man's hands on the counter become Stevie's hands. In a diner, the white owner points an Iranian away from the counter. At the party, a woman fans herself with a hat. In a hall, a drug dealer strides ominously past the boy at the vent. Now a fat woman's hip bumps a guy in a crotch as she dances. A woman nearby laughs. Our view floats down toward the party vent and away from the studio vent. Couples at the party caress each other as they dance. Shame on them. Shame on them. Shame on as in Vogue sways together, two kids dance battle on the sidewalk. Stevie's fingers slap the keys. The woman in gold heels wears brass knuckles on a necklace. Now our view passes through the ceiling of Stevie's studio to the party above. Loose floorboards shift underfoot. Out front, the team dance energetically. Stevie rocks his shoulders as he plays his keyboard. As a fader on a mix board slides down, it turns into a zipper on a woman's dress. A man eases the zipper open and reaches for his wedding ring. Now a toddler peeks into Stevie's studio. The toddler climbs onto the drum set stool. As Stevie sings into his mic, the little boy bangs drumsticks on the snare. The boy slips off the stool. A female dancer does the splits through a partner's legs. In bed, a woman dips her fingers in a jar of skin cream and rubs it over her bare leg. Now the toddler taps on the drum standing up. As a car outside rocks back and forth, a drink and a party glass wavers. The little girl's mother dances with her daughter standing on her shoes. Images of sweaty people dancing and smiling throughout the building flash rapidly. The boy in the hall honks a bicycle horn. The girl in braids hugs her friends. Now two men in plain clothes chase the drug dealer. The bearded man in a wheelchair smiles victoriously to the sky. The woman in bed kisses her partner. As the lights flicker at the party and in the studio, men lead the dealer away from the building in handcuffs. The singers and party guests continue dancing, and Stevie and the band continues doing what they do best, and it's making that feel-good music. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes the point really quite, uh, quite well, this notion of including description. I, I don't know how many times I've seen that video, and every time the description clues me into something that I didn't notice. I'm an old sighted guy, you know, I see, right? But I miss half of it if I'm just looking passively, if not really trying to look as a describer must look, which is as, a, as an active seer, if you will. Um, I do wanna make uh, sure you guys know about the American Council of the Vines Audio Description Project, uh, uh, an initiative I founded about 12 years ago. I have on the screen now the um, <clears throat> Uh, homepage uh, from the website. Um, it, we have, oh golly, in addition to the website where you can find out all about description, what's on TV right now with description, what DVDs, what uh, performing arts spaces, what museums in your state, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to that, we have all kinds of initiatives. We do uh, formal training of audio describers twice a year, the Audio Description Institute. We're doing our 20th in uh, uh, August. Um, we have conferences every other year. We do awards for the best in audio description around the world. Uh, we have a great, um, 
a contest for blind kids who write reviews of short videos. What about the description made sense for them, help them what, you know? And we give them prizes and their teachers prizes uh, and that sort of thing, uh, all kinds of things. So I encourage you to, to visit uh, the American Council of the Blind's audio description project. There it is, the URL HTTPS colon slash slash ADP dot ACB dot org. I want to leave time for uh, uh, questions. I see a bunch in the chat and, and in the Q&A, uh, but let me just end with um, a, a, a story, a true story. A blind fellow was um, visiting a museum with some friends and a sighted woman had the temerity to approach him and ask him and said, excuse me, but what are you doing in a museum? You, you can't see any of the exhibits. Why are you here? Well, he was a little taken aback, but his response, I'm here for the same reason anyone goes to a museum. I want to learn. I want to know. I want to be a part of our culture. His inability to see shouldn't deny him access to culture. And I I think it's the responsibility of our arts institutions in particular to be as inclusive as possible. It's about access to our culture and that is everyone's right. There simply is no good reason why a person with a physical disability must also be culturally disadvantaged. No. And in fact, I believe in the social model of disability, which dictates that people with disabilities are not encumbered so much by their physical situation as much as they are by the way society fails to accommodate them. In other words, if you have a building that was built without ramps and just steps, well then a person who uses a wheelchair is disabled. If there's a ramp there, the disability goes away. They have access like anybody else. Um, it's about how society accommodates people. And I think uh, the, the greater use of description, of captioning, of subtitling, of, of um, sign interpreting is, is all for the good. And I do wanna emphasize one point. In the United States, the principal constituency for audio description, people who are blind, have a 70% unemployment rating, 70%. That's unacceptable. But I think that with more meaningful access to culture and its resources, people become more informed. They become more engaged with society. Maybe they become more engaging individuals and thus perhaps more employable. So with that, I've got my contact information here. If we don't get to your question uh, during the chat here, uh, please feel free to write to me at uh, audiodescribe. Audiodescribe.com is the URL for my own uh, uh, company, Audio Description Associates, Jay Snyder at audiodescribe.com. Look at that, I wrote a book. Hey, uh, the visual made verbal, a comprehensive training manual and guide to the history and applications of audio description published by the American Council of the Blind in 2014. It's also available now in Braille and as an audiobook from the Library of Congress. And it's in six languages now. I'm proud to uh, mention uh, print languages. It's English, uh, Polish, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. And Italian is being worked on. It should be released uh, later this year. Uh, and speaking of our Audio Description Institute, our training sessions, uh, the 20th Audio Description Project, Audio Description Institute will be held this uh, August, August 8 through 12, all virtual again this year. Um, you can stay in touch with us uh, through the website, adp.acb.org for updates. We're, we're uh, taking um, applications now. And um, what that shows to Goya is if uh, you did not enjoy the last 45 minutes with me, you will definitely not enjoy five days with me. So keep, keep, that, keep that in mind. And with that, Rachel, let's uh, 
go to the chat. Let's go to the Q&A and see uh, who's got what for us here. Okay, this is Sam Joel. I'll start. Sam, of course. That's a, um, the first question goes back to your description of the AD with the three curved lines from your first yes. screen. And the question asks, does three curved lines fully describe those lines? It doesn't say they're parallel or arc, et cetera. So seeing the user, so the seeing user sees much more than three curved lines. I can see they represent sound waves, but it, but hearing three curved lines would not be enough to lead me to that conclusion. So yeah, that, I think there's yeah. a question about three curved lines by itself. I, I think that's a valid uh, question. Um, I think I, my, I belong to a minimalist school of, of audio description. Um, and I believe what I said, uh, uh, and, um, uh, what did I say? My, my phrase that I used was mirroring the curve in the D uh, adjacent to the curve in the D three curved lines. So I think that represents the concaveness certainly of it. Uh, and it, it, it should dispel any notion that maybe they're horizontal and not vertical. They're vertical, of course. Um, but I, I take your point. It, it's really a matter of um, making sure you're clear and, and understandable, but with as few words as possible. So there's a balancing act there. Uh, and I, I think you've made a good point though. Okay, Joel, the next question says, uh, the writers uh, types, I'm a technical writer and love writing alt text as a fun exercise <laughs> to describe yeah. images as clearly with as few words as possible. How does audio description writing differ? Additionally, is audio describer a job or a career path? Where would I look for more opportunities like that? Yeah, uh, all tags are a kind of description. Um, I, I say it like that because it, it, they really involve labels, names, titles, and labels, names, titles are not descriptions. Um, so, it, it gives you information, it tells you. I think the best audio description shows you. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, abbreviated audio description uh, that is helpful on websites. Uh, sometimes people will do expanded audio description for a website or even for a film, they'll, they'll give you an option to click here and get a, a far more, this kind of goes back to the last question, a far more complete audio description of a piece uh, that is, there's just no time in the middle of a film to do that. Um, as far as uh, uh, jobs, yes, audio description is very much a growth industry in this country. You know, we, it took us uh, uh, you know, I started with this 41 years ago with the very first audio description service in 1981 at Arena Stage, started in theater. Uh, and uh, I've been working with it ever since, um, doing nothing but audio description for over 20 years, uh, working with it, speaking on it, training, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, nowadays, you know, it, it took forever just to get our 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, which mandates description on nine networks very limited right now, but that's going to increase. And beyond that, though, every major film nowadays comes out with audio description because of the Americans with Disabilities Act, primarily, uh, and the streaming services. Uh, and they present far more films than are in the movie theaters. They have embraced it without being required to do it. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity private firms, commercials are doing audio description. So I would, like anything else, you want to get a little training behind you before you approach it. And, and in the Institute, we actually provide a list of about 20 uh, of the principal audio description producers, providers uh, around the country. So that would be something to think about. Joel, the next question is asking about the Stevie Wonder video where yeah. Buster Rhymes does voice, uh, does audio description. Um, well, I, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to correct you there sorry. because Buster Rhymes voices, voices the audio sorry. description written by somebody else. People do that all the time. They conflate the two. And I always pick on that because I think it's important to make the distinction. The, the question is, and it's from someone who works in higher education, is the video with audio description available online for purchase? Uh, I I think so. Um, I'm almost, I don't want to speak for Mr. Wonder, but uh, I'm almost certain that it's available on YouTube or Vimeo. 
uh, just to play. Uh, but I, I don't want to get in a problem there with saying, oh, you can use his work for free, um, that kind of thing. It may very well be available for purchase as well. Uh, I would just uh, search for it uh, on Google, through Amazon, that kind of thing. Next question. If you were asked to make a webcast video accessible and the webcast only contains three people talking in side-by-side -side screens and nothing else, no presentations or graphics, are audio descriptions required or only transcripts and captioning? No, they're not required. Uh, and that's actually, uh, I think, a bit of a a gap in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Not to say that meet the press on Sundays should be audio described. Listen, I like tuning into the news, you know, experiencing meet the press. I never watch it. I listen to it when it's rebroadcast on C-SPAN in the afternoon <clears throat> because I get everything just through the sound. It doesn't need to be described. I think description, um, you know, it, it just makes sense for it to be used where it's most needed. And there are so many examples of where it can be most needed. I've done workshops with the National Association of Broadcasters that help uh, weathercasters and newscasters um, try to describe as they go. Audio descriptions doesn't have to be added in. They, they can be more descriptive with their language as they go and avoid silly things like, uh, as you can see, well, not everybody can see, and, and over there, what does over there mean? You know, that kind of thing. So, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, yeah, I, I, I think um, um, meet the press, you know, three screens, people talking. No, I don't think it's necessary. Next question asks, through your work, what have you found related to audio description resources for educational videos and services that libraries maybe using in higher education, how can we find more videos that are audio described? Oh. Is there a way to search on that category? Oh, sure. Uh, audio description project. We list now, I think, over 7,000 videos that have audio description. And many of them we link directly to where it, that video is streamed or where you can buy the DVD. Uh, so go to the Audio Description Project website, adp.acb.org. Uh, we also, I think pretty much we list uh, 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 other uh, educational materials. My book just recently in Europe uh, was released a 650 page uh, tome called the Rutledge Handbook of Audio Description. Uh, I wrote two of its chapters. I think there's some 28 chapters in there from contributors all around the world. And it's only like $240 or something because it's an academic treatise, but you can get it on Kindle for 40 bucks. Uh, anyway, there, there's loads of literature on audio description if you uh, can search for it. Uh, and I can help you with that if you send me a note. Okay. Um, the next question is uh, asks about checklist. Is there a checklist to refer to while working on audio description? Um, you know, some producers, I'm sure, <coughs> I'm sure will develop a, a kind of a checklist. Of, did we do this, 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 and this? Um, I don't have that in my book. I don't, uh, I, I think I refer to, to that kind of thing. Um, uh, some describers will keep posted by their screen, you know, uh, a, a adjectives, uh, verbs that may come up periodically and helps them. You know, when, I, when we started with all of this, uh, I gave my describers at the National Captioning Institute a copy of Roger's Thesaurus, the book. You had to look at a book. Well, now you have thesaurus.com. You know, it's all on screen there, right there with you. It's much easier to help spur your, your memory, that kind of thing. So um, um, I think that answers your question. Did I get that? Yeah, I think <laughs> oh, so. Good. All right. Um, the next question is about time. How long does it take to write audio description for, say, an hour of video? Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be it depends. And so you bet there's an it depends because if you're writing description for Meet the Press, it's a half hour program. You can probably do that in 15 minutes or something because you go cue to cue or you go, you know, you go from gap to gap to gap, that kind of thing. You don't want to cover the dialogue. No, we, I've developed a, a rule of thumb some years ago that to develop the initial script for uh, the initial audio description script for a half hour of video or film uh, takes, uh, I, I, let me do it differently. 
it takes uh, anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes to develop audio description for three to five minutes of film. That's a full day, work day for a half hour show. Um, some people do it faster, some people do it slower, some people really spend time with research and analysis, go over it and over it, and then sometimes it's tested by people who are blind, who are quality control experts, um, and then it has to be voiced, then it has to be recorded, et cetera, et cetera, so you add that in there. But it's a, you know, um, it takes time, you know, uh, to, to find the right words. Blaise Pascal, the famous 17th century mathematician and philosopher once said at the end of a long letter to a friend, he said, forgive me, I've only made this letter longer because I've not had the time to make it shorter. Description, it takes time to be a writer, to, to edit, to, to come up with the right words. Okay, Joel, next uh, question is, speaking of YouTube, Thoughts on YouTube offering mm -hmm. settings to play audio <laughs> descriptions? That, that's the question right now. Yes. Closed captions can be turned on or off. Are they, or should they offer an option to add audio description? Yes, and we've been bugging them about it for oh, years. And I believe there is, I don't even know how to access it, but I'm told there is a beta version of a video player that you can use on YouTube that will allow you to toggle on and off the description. It's nuts that they don't have it. Same for Vimeo, same for uh, just about any other video player. There are video players out there that have that toggle switch. What's the deal? How long does it take to incorporate that in your websites? Um, I, I think it should be there because what happens instead is that people will post their video. They're not going to post it with open description because we haven't gotten to the point where sighted people will uh, will will uh, be able to accommodate the description all the time. Usually, it's kind of like, especially if it's bad description, it's like, why is that guy telling me what I can I can see? What, what is it? What is that? It can be distracting and annoying. So people will not post open description. They'll post. The, the regular quote unquote video, and then post another link to the, the video with description, it, it, separate but equal, uh, two, two videos. It's a waste of space. Back in the days of VHS, you know, part of the reason we, <laughs> description got away from VHS, I mean, technology developed, but the poor blockbuster video, they had only so much shelf space. They had to have two copies of every video, one with description, one without, because VHS, you couldn't turn it on and off. DVD, ah, that was great because you could turn it on and off. Okay, this is the last question, uh, I think in a moment. Uh, there's another that came in, but it says, how do you That's manage a audio describing a video or a movie that has really fast dialogue <laughs> with minimal time to interject descriptions of the scenes or in the scene? Right, Th there are two biggest challenges in that respect. It, 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 one challenge is like the color of paradise, where you have a two and a half minute segment with no dialogue. You have critical sound elements that you don't want to get in the way. It's not licensed to go on at the mouth, but you have plenty of time and you want to use it carefully. The other challenge is when, yeah, you have a talk, 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 fast paced comedy kind of thing. You will be surprised. Um, how much can be said in a split second, a word, even a short phrase that allows you to convey what's most critical, he points to his head, and uh, what, what's to it, critical to an understanding, he points to his head, of the piece and, and an appreciation, his hand is on his heart, of the piece. Just the second is available sometimes. We also have to, you know, some, some of that dialogue is kind of throwaway. Uh, and I say that with the greatest respect for screenwriters, but um, if the screenwriter, if the, if the character on, in the film is, uh, um, uh, something like that, well, you have to decide, is it more important for the blind viewer to know what's going on visually than to hear the uh, 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 um, thing? and make that judgment. Yeah, golden rule, don't cover the dialogue, uh, but uh, there are exceptions to everything. And the last question, I think, Joel, before our time is up. Sure. Uh, the question is, is, talking of employment 
of people with visual impairment, uh, how does audio description play a role? Oh, thank you. I should have mentioned this and because I mentioned this all the time and it went out of my head for some reason, but people who are blind, uh, this all began with a blind woman, Margaret Fansteel, and a blind guy, Chet Avery, in the Washington, D.C. area. People who are blind can be expert uh, quality control experts can be expert consumer consultants on the writing of the audio description script. They may not be able to see everything. They, they certainly don't see everything or limited vision. So they're working with a trained describer, perhaps. Uh, and there's some thought about that, too. You know, can a blind person be a describer? I'll leave that go. But they could certainly be that consultant. They can certainly be some of the best blind, uh, uh, some of the best uh, voice talents in the industry are people who are blind. And some of the best audio editors are people who are totally blind. So very much so. Uh, it is a growth industry for people who are blind. And I'm going to put in my other little tag here is that there's a bit of a movement afoot to use more text to speech, AI, mechanical synthetic speech. Well, I don't think it works, not for description of films and videos. And you're taking employment away from blind people. So that's my little soapbox on that. So I'm Joel, I'm going to, uh, our colleague Lane has has put up kind of our closing slide. You bet. So I'm going to turn this over to Lane. But Joel, we can't thank you enough. The oh. comments in chat, people are really excited about having oh, the opportunity to learn with you today. Thanks um, so much. Thank you. And our, our big thanks to our captioning team and to Beth for sign language interpretation lane. Yes. Yeah, just echo Sam's thank you to you, Joel, and all of our Great. attendees. Thank you so much um, for joining us for this session. And keep in mind some of the upcoming webinars presented by IAAP include the fourth in this series next Thursday, the 23rd accessibility of social media. Um, June 28th, stop screaming into the void, getting accessibility ideas heard. And June 30th, the pitfalls of need machine generated PDFs. Not sure why machine was so difficult to say, but again, thank you everyone for joining us. Joel, I always appreciate sitting in on your sessions. Thank oh, you. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye.